13 head to the quarterfinals after surviving Calypso eliminations. The CBI program critical to the success of what will be Dominica's first resort under the Marriott brand and a 34-year-old formerly charged with the last week's murder in Lubia. I am Julian Morris with the Channel 5 News. The details after this. First up, one Trinidadian national is among the 13 making it to the quarterfinal round of the Calypso competition. Andrea Louis has more. Going by the stage name Stefan, the swinging star's singer made his debut on the Calypso stage on Saturday night with his song titled Dominica Love, which got the judges' vote to move forward in the competition. Former junior Calypso Monarch competitor Fael De Gila Landa, competing on the big stage for the first time, also made it to the quarterfinals round with his rendition, I Believe. 62 people participated in the eliminations on Saturday, and the other Calypsonians making it to the next round are Jude J.D. Delaney singing All The Way, Kerwin Mighty Omi Kazemi with Blind Date, Gael Trinity Regist singing Panama, Victor Comfort a Beak with Coli, Chris Crisby Sylvester singing Human Behavior, Dinashell with Who Will Be My Hero, Leona Peter singing Me and Me Alone, Jared Genius Dorset with Dubai Delegation, veteran Calypsonian Reginald Third Eye Lander, who is also the father of Fire Lander, and he sang Calypso Injustice. Also making it to the quarterfinals are former monarchs Tasha, Tasha P. Peltier with Free Lunch and Keith Tronada Ito with Some of Us Have to Leave. Meantime, the five Calypsonians on reserve are Emmanuel Higsey Salamat, Della Gachette, Desmond de Clark Clark, Bradley B.O. Bradley Oscar, and Jasta Judgment Williams. The quarterfinals round is scheduled for 28th January. And the importance of the Citizenship by Investment program to key hotel projects here has been highlighted by CEO of Silver Beach Development, Alec Lawrence. Mr. Lawrence told the launch of the Silver Beach Resort and Spa at the State House on Monday the success of the hotel project carded for Portsmouth is directly linked to the success of the CBI program. The resort will be built under Marriott's Lifestyle Boutique category. Our intention in Silver Beach is to construct a resort which reflects and delivers such uniqueness without comp compromising quality and five-star service. The Lawrence family was able to undertake this project to build a five-star resort because of the real estate option under the CBI program. One of the core objectives of this development is to provide jobs for the people of Dominica and to assist in improving the economy of our beloved country. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what Silver Beach is all about. Make no mistake about it. The project will create hundreds of jobs for Dominicans during the construction phase and the post-construction phase of the hotel. Moreover, entrepreneurs and vendors will have the great opportunity to establish partnership with the management of Silver Beach to provide goods and services to the hotel. More importantly, Silver Beach will provide for the training of Dominicans locally, regionally, and internationally to provide the skills required for employment in the hospitality industry. Prime Minister and Minister for Finance Roosevelt Skerritt has congratulated the developers of the Silver Beach Resort and Spa, formally welcoming the Mar Marriott Resorts to Dominica. Prime Minister Skerritt said it was a proud moment for the country. Very often, we ask the private sector to step forward and step up to the plate. Today, we are seeing a classic manifestation of this, and I salute all concerned with bringing this project to the point of official launch today. I want also to implore other Dominicans to let this be a source of inspiration to you, to step forward and take the leap into entrepreneurship. Mr. Skerritt said this project could not have come at a better time for Dominica. Global events are creating an environment in which small island states like Dominica have to look within to craft and develop a formula for progress and success. 
Great Britain, Canada, the United States of America, and several other countries in Europe and Eastern Asia are in transitional and transformational mode. It will be a while before the focus moves beyond the bounds of grappling with and managing their own social, geopolitical, and economic challenges. Dominica, I am satisfied, is up to the challenge of rowing its own boat ashore. We will continue to form alliances and to enhance relations with friendly nations, but we shall also roll back our shirt sleeves as a nation and get on the job of building and developing this country of ours. The Prime Minister also intends on using the Marriott brand in marketing Dominica around the world. He expects that the Marriott brand will help greatly in redefining Dominica as a must-see destination in the Caribbean. Meantime, Portsmouth business people are organizing themselves to capitalize on international brand hotel projects in that town. Portsmouth Mayor Titus Francis told Channel 5 News the business sector should position itself to take advantage of developing opportunities in the north. We are in the process of setting up what we have not given it a name yet, but an organization that will represent the, the, the business community of Portsmouth. A number of business um, persons, uh, owners are very excited about the prospect and, um, and, and are, are willing to, to participate and be part of that initial um, discussion process. Together with that, um, the, all of that is being facilitated um, through the Caribbean Local Economic Development Project, CARI-LED. This will be a first of its kind venture for Portsmouth when formalized. Recognizing that um, <clears throat> you have the Kempinski Hotel, you have the, the Moroccan funded hotel, there is, um, I think, Silver Beach, which is also in the, in the making. Anything in terms of tourism development, unless our business community can position themselves to take advantage of the opportunities, and, and obviously there are going to be opportunities. Unless they can do that, then we will just lose everything. And um, I'm not being pessimistic, I'm not, neither am I being kind of parochial, but the point is, if we don't organize ourselves to take advantage, then we will lose the opportunities in Portsmouth. And, and the council is prepared to, to play that, that, that facilitating role in the process. In police news, son of, the, of Dr. Paul Ricketts, by the same name, has been admitted as he was seriously injured in an accident at Picard. Police reports say the bike he was riding collided with a small truck resulting in an explosion. From what we are told, the truck driver was able to exit the vehicle. Based on the pictures on social media, Ricketts' legs appear to have been severely impacted. Police are also investigating an incident in Point Michel where one man was reportedly shot multiple times at close range following an argument. And 34-year-old Steve Olive of the Kalinago Territory is on remand at the state prison after he was charged in connection with the murder of 31-year-old Vada Laville of Marigot, who lived in Lubia. Olive appeared before a Rosa magistrate last Friday where the murder charge was read to him. He was not represented and was not required to enter a plea since the matter is an indictable offence. The preliminary inquiry into the matter is set for May 19, 2017. You are watching Channel 5 News. Coming up, some of the problems surrounding abandoned lots in the city of Roseau. Thank you for staying with us. The Roseau mayor is eyeing abandoned lots in the city as possible properties for development projects. Her Worship Irene John says uh, Roseau City Council continues to try to find the owners of those abandoned lots. We are in the process of finding who the owners are okay. and to, 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 to speak with them and to see how we can arrive you know, mm -hmm. at, um, at a decision whether it's to enter into a lease, whether it's to have them sell the property, whether it's to have them build or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, a system has been put in place to, to look into, into that. Mm -hmm. Mayor John has identified abandoned lots as number two on a list of challenges facing the city council in the upkeep of the city. Some abandoned properties in the city, some of um, which the, we, we cannot find the owners, probably some of them are dead, some live overseas, and the buildings are really eyesore in the city. 
it would be good if we could transform them, you know, into, you know, something useful. Either a place where the vendors could vend or um, parking, you know, in the city because we know this is a big challenge. The number of vehicles that are in the, in the country now and they're still coming. Or, or some of the vendors that are all over the place, you know, we could probably have it organized in such a way that they could vend there, you know, and make life a little better, you know, for, for the pedestrians in the city. She, however, has not yet identified specific abandoned lots for the desired projects. Meantime, one such abandoned property is on 5 to 7 Great Marlborough Street, and according to a resident there, people have been using that particular plot as a public restroom. Mervyn John Baptist lives just five feet from the abandoned property. This lot um, right at the back of me, which is um, for the past eight months, um, has become a public convenience where people do their number one and their number twos there on a daily basis. Now, um, it reaches a point where right now I am disturbed when I'm at home because I don't live too far from the empty lot and um, it's actually posing a problem there. Where in the kitchen and both in the drawing room, when the wind blows, the scent of the filth comes right through my house. I have called um, on the owner of the land, which is right uh, to actually put a gate what that was there before and is not there anymore, why people um, are accessing the land. John Baptist says he has already complained to the city council and environmental health department. If tourism is everybody's business and in the middle of Roseau, we have an empty lot which is, uh, has been used as a public convenience, I think this is very wrong. Something has to be done. And I'm calling on the authorities, whoever it may be, to see what's happening there, come and see for themselves uh, the stench that is coming from there. And General Manager of the Agriculture, Industrial and Development Bank, the Aid Bank, Julius Corbett, is refuting claims that farmers are being turned down for loans under the new loan facility at the bank. Andrea Louis reports. In August last year, an agreement was signed between the government of Dominica and the Aid Bank for a loan facility at the bank, which made available $10 million to unlend to farmers at a 3% interest rate with a grace period of six months. In the few months since its existence, several farmers have benefited from the facility, while others have not been successful. During an interview with Channel 5 News, Aid Bank General Manager sought to clear the air. Initially, um, we had a few glitches in terms of what they were required to bring and what we were asking them to bring. But over the few months, we have somewhat relaxed that. So it's working very smoothly. And um, we are experiencing greater demands on a regular basis. And so we're pleased about it. There are a few farmers who have been making some queries with respect to our process. But sometimes the farmers have not done what I've always spoken about, that they've got to treat that as a business. Historically, you go out there, you grow your, your farm, and you feed your family. But no, that's not a question. Farmers have to be understand, appreciate that this is a business. And as a business, you run it that way. So there must be reliability of labor, there must be resources, must be available. The general manager gave an idea of what is required from the farmer in order to be approved for a loan and pointed out that sometimes the process of getting the requisite items from the farmer can be lengthy. Uh, we asked them to give us an idea of what is it. Have you been doing farming before? Are you coming here primarily because you heard money at Aid Bank, come and get your money? You know, no, we asked them basic questions that the lender would ask. Tell us exactly what is it that you did? How much property do you have to develop? Is the property you're going to develop is yours? Do you have the right? to the property. If some farmers are coming, for example, and you give them a list of the things that they have to break. I say, sure. And then two weeks pass, you haven't heard us, so we have to call and say, hey guys, by the way, you were here three weeks ago, what happened? Oh, well, I'm trying to get this and I get in with that, you know. And when they do get the stuff, they bring pieces of hand, pieces there, and it, it, it makes the process a lot lengthier than we would like here at the bank, because our role is to get the money out. 
while not disclosing the number of farmers who have been granted loans under the facility or the amount of money already approved for loans, Corbett noted that the majority of farmers who are benefiting from the facility are from the West Coast, the North and the Northeast of the country. He explains that the bank has gone on an island-wide educational drive to ensure the maximum number of farmers take advantage of the loan facility. So we have we, we had to do what I call a farmer orientation. So we we went out there on a regular basis, I think weekly. We went to various communities. We held meetings and discussions with them, and we educated them. So it is a it is educational process. They understand that we understand that, and so far things are moving very nicely. We are very happy about the whole program, and we have right now an agricultural development officer who goes out and speaks to them and she revisits them and we have uh, someone who's helping her. So we work in conjunction with the agricultural ministry. The aid bank general manager also revealed that the institution is working towards getting farm insurance to help farmers. Andrea Lui, Channel 5 News. And murder and matters of sexual nature are leading on the cause list as the session of the criminal court opens Tuesday at the High Court in Roseau. Of the 45 matters on the list, two of them are for sentencing. They are Florence Telemach and Kenroy Paul. Sherman Webb is to be retried for the murder of Barbadian Corey Polymore. Mitchell Toussaint is also set to be retried for murder. The other murders are Vivian Charles, Daniel Ibanis, Rudy Jr. Jones, and Montel Dick, who is charged with the Carnival Monday 2015 murder of Ken Mitchell. Edison Kurt Pemberton is also charged with attempted murder. Lyndon St. Louis and uh, Brian Dorival are charged with causing death by dangerous driving. Other cases include bestiality, indecent assault, rape, unlawful sexual intercourse, and attempted buggery. High Court Judge Victoria Clark Charles will preside. That's news. Coming up, Kenny Williams with your sports highlights. First up in sports, Dublin Football Club moved one step closer to retaining their championship title when they defeated Caribbean Cool Harlem United 1-0 in action from the DFA Flow Premier League on the weekend. Middleham United beat RIC Kensbro 3-0. The Exodus FC versus Bath Estate game was very competitive, finishing 3-2 in favor of Exodus. Sajiko Southeast beat Waki Rollers 2-1, and there was no play in the Petro Caribbean Point Michel versus Northern Concrete and Steel Bombers match. Meantime, in the first division, East Central bested LA Stars 2-0. Sophia Spartans had similar fortunes when they beat Club Lubia 2-0 and Trafalgar FC defeated 7-11 Portersville Tavish United 1-0. Sports continues with this item where the West Indies Cricket Board has appointed Johnny Grave as the new Chief Executive Officer after a recent rigorous recruitment process. Johnny joins the organization with a wealth of experience from the Professional Cricketers Association in the UK where he worked as Commercial Director for the last nine years. He also occupied several senior level roles in the Surrey County Cricket Club. Meantime, top order batsman Darren Bravo has been excluded from Trinidad and Tobago's squad ahead of the Najiko Super 50 later this month. According to ESPN Crick Info, Bravo was served notice by the WICB to meet with them following a breach of contract last November and the TNT Cricket Board said they would only rule on Bravo after he sat down with the WICB. The report suggests that Bravo's availability will be dependent on the outcome of his meeting with the WICB. TNT Red Force won the 2015-2016 competition with much help from Bravo, who was the top scorer with 274 runs in three matches. In related sports, the West Indies Under-19 squad will have a tour match of South Africa later this year in preparation for the ICC's Under-19 World Cup in 2018. West Indies won the 2016 World Cup final under the leadership of Shimron Hitmeyer. The squad will be coached by Graham West and will be looking forward to defending their title in January 2018 in New Zealand. The tour match will run from June 30 to July 27 and feature two warm-up matches against South Africa and five one-day internationals against South Africa's under-19 team. 
Onto table tennis, where president-elect of the local association, Edgar Baird, says the recent decision by the Dominica Olympic Committee to not recognize the Dominica Table Tennis Association as a legitimate body may have negative implications for the sport. This as the sport was coming back on stream after being dormant for a number of years. Table tennis have been somehow dormant for many years, and the, 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 the members say, so it said that, okay, one of the persons we know we can trust to revive table tennis would be Edgar Berridge. And then went to an election, won it convincingly. I'm rather surprised that um, Mr. Wilson and his executive would fail to recognize the, the decision of the members that voted in that election. It, it, it stagnant this spot, it, 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 it kept us back because there are a lot of programs that we have to put in, put in place, which of course we would have to go to, to the Olympic Committee to get assistance and for that reason we cannot because of, of, of that decision. I find that decision was very draconial. Meantime, sports consultant Joseph Thomas weighed in on the matter, saying the implementation of a National Sports Council would be a good mediator in this situation. But it's rather unfortunate, really, that um, the Dominic Olympic Committee took that stance. Um, table tennis, we know, is one of the minor sports, minor Olympic sports here in Dominica. They were going through and have been going through a number of challenges. Even when I was secretary of the Dominica Table Tennis Association, back then, many years ago, we had our challenges. I have, for over 34 years of my life, been advocating for the setting up and an, um, establishment of a National Sports Council. And these are areas is that the National Sports Council could come in, not to side one another, but to sort of a sort and meet and, you know, dialogue and offer some form of, um, how should I put it, some resolve to, to this matter. As it is, there is no such body that the Table Tennis Association can refer to. And they're just left in the cold. As long as the Dominica uh, Olympic Committee decides not to recognize them, I'm afraid that's going to happen and continue to happen. Speaking with Felix Wilson over the phone, the DOC president said he is not interested in a back and forth with the DTTA. However, he is hoping the body addresses the matter in a more amicable way without media involvement. He says the DOC has written to the DTTA on the matter and is awaiting a response. Back with more cricket, we can tell you that Australia defeated Pakistan by 220 runs in the third test on the weekend. In the first innings, Australia batted first and scored 538 for eight declared, with centuries from Matt Renshaw, 184, David Warner, 113, and Peter Hanscom, 110. In reply, Pakistan folded on 315. Yonis Khan added 175 not out and Azhar Ali, 71. In the second innings, the Australian side declared on 241 for two, with 79 from Usman Kawaja and Stephen Smith, 59. Set 465 for victory, the Pakistan team crumbled for 244 in 80.2 overs underneath a supreme Australian bowling attack. Australia won the three-match series 3-0. Three Meantime, New Zealand won the 30-20 against Bangladesh by 27 runs on Sunday. The Zealanders took first knock and reached 194 for four. Corey Anderson made 94 not out and Kane Williamson 60. Set 195 for victory, Bangladesh replied with 167 for 6 with the highest score by a Bangladesh batsman being 42. New Zealand won the three-match series 3-0. That's all the sporting highlights for now. I am Kenny Williams. Join us next time. Your weather report is next. Hello, good evening. Welcome to tonight's weather broadcast. I will be your presenter for this evening, Farah Rock Korea. Today, a high pressure system was the dominant feature across the Lesser Antilles. We move on now to some earlier visible satellite imagery and what it showed is some high level clouds extending from the Atlantic Ocean over Martinique into the Caribbean Sea as well as over Guadeloupe. What we also see is this area of multi layered clouds just north of Barbados. Earlier radar imagery of this afternoon indicated some scattered 
show us uh, over the north of uh, Barbados, and that is associated with the multi layered clouds I mentioned earlier. We see as well some scattered showers across the Leeward Islands as well. The weather tonight is expected to be fair to partly cloudy with some scattered showers expected in the interior of the island. The weather tomorrow is expected to be occasionally cloudy with some scattered showers. Let's take a look now at the marine forecast. Well, sea conditions will be moderate and waves are expected to pick up to 7 feet. An increase in northerly swells is expected late Wednesday into Thursday. All users of the sea are advised to be vigilant and to exercise a caution. Let's take a look now at the the weather for the next three days tomorrow or Tuesday occasional cloudy skies with some scattered showers on Wednesday it will start off as fairly partly cloudy however as the frontal boundary dips further southwards an increase in cloudiness and showers is expected late Wednesday into Thursday on Thursday it will start off as generally cloudy with some showers however a relative improvement is expected as the day progresses the weather tomorrow for the rest of the Caribbean, well, occasional cloudy skies with some scattered showers can be expected across the islands. Let's move on now on to the international city forecast. Well, overcast skies with some sub-zero temperatures are expected for the city of New York. Partly cloudy skies for Miami and London. Some cloudy conditions with some showers expected for Caracas and some sunny skies expected for the city of Beijing. The sun will rise tomorrow at 6.35 a.m. and will set at 5.52 p.m. Feel free to visit our website at weather.gov.dm or call the weather hotline at 447-5555. Join us tomorrow evening for an extra broadcast. Thank you. To end the news, the headlines again, 13 head to quarterfinals after surviving Calypso eliminations. The CBI program critical to success of what will be Dominica's first resort under the Marriott brand. And a 34-year-old formally charged with last week's murder in Lubia. Feel free to contact us at news at mapping2k4.com. You can also access our past newscasts on our YouTube channel. On behalf of the production team, I am Julian Morris. To our viewers around the world, thank you for watching.